zinc. Many of you will note that vitamin C has fallen out of our prescription list and therefore we will not talk about it. The rest vitamin A, vitamin D and zinc support the body to build immunity to fight COVID-19. Taking too much of these can cause nausea, diarrhea and stomach cramps. And therefore, we advise that they are limited to prescription by the health workers. The third is the antibiotics, azithromycin and amoxicillin. These are reserved for those who present with moderate disease, especially those with signs of pneumonia, with no need for oxygen, and they should be used cautiously. Reckless use, as in self-medication, will contribute to antibiotic resistance. Antibiotics have no added advantage on the mild and asymptomatic cases, and the public is requested to desist from procuring these drugs off the counter and taking them without guidance from a medical practitioner. The intravenous or injectable forms of the drugs are indicated for patients with severe disease or critical patients and should only be administered to patients in hospital under the supervision of medical personnel. Steroids, and in this case we are talking about dexamethasone. We have noticed many people who were infected with COVID-19 and have been under home-based care presenting with side effects such as high blood glucose and increase in weight from use of this steroid. Dexamethasone is only indicated in patients with severe COVID-19 and should only be given by a health professional. Prolonged misuse in other cases in the absence of a health worker to monitor the patient may lead to serious skin, brain, and hormonal side effects. Therefore, we caution the public to leave the prescription of this medicine to health workers. Oxygen. The ministry has also observed unregulated use of oxygen at home and in vehicles. Oxygen should only be given to patients admitted to hospitals under the guidance of a professional health worker. Aware that due to fear, many people may have procured pulse oximeters to monitor their oxygen levels, the Ministry of Health advises that COVID-19 patients with blood oxygen levels below 90 92% should report to hospitals for assessment and further management. Unregulated use of oxygen may cause damage to our lungs, so avoid it. We'll later on speak at length about use of oxygen at home. The next is specialized drugs such as clexane and others like heparin should be avoided. This is indicated for patients with severe COVID-19 and if misused can cause bleeding which can be deadly. Use of other drugs such as colchicine, remdesivir, ivermectin and other investigational and repurposed drugs is still under study by the Ugandan scientists. The ministry strongly discourages use of these drugs outside research or investigational settings. We'll now talk about burial of people who have succumbed to COVID-19. The Ministry of Health developed guidelines for handling of bodies of persons that have passed on due to COVID-19 with guidance from the World Health Organization. The guidance outlines the process of safe handling of bodies of persons that have died both at the health facility and in the community. The body of the deceased should be put in a body bag 
and then placed inside a coffin and handed over to the family members for safe burial. Family members are advised not to tamper with the body bags or desire to touch the body at any time and strictly adhere to all the COVID-19 standard operating procedures while conducting the burial. As per the President's directives, the general public is reminded to limit burials to only family members and in any case not more than 20 people. We'll now talk about expansion of testing capacity by use of COVID-19 antigen RDTs. The Ministry of Health commenced the use of antigen RDTs in November 2020 in 30 priority districts as a pilot to inform the scale up. Currently, the Ministry of Health has distributed RDTs to all the national referral hospitals, regional referral hospitals, district hospitals, health center threes and fours. Uganda Prison Services, Isolation Centers, and non-traditional treatment facilities like Nambole. Our guidelines require use of the antigen RDTs in patients presenting with COVID-19-like symptoms only. RDTs should not be used for screening of asymptomatic people so please ensure adherence to these guidelines when using these RDTs. And this information is particularly given to all those who are currently using the RDTs. To scale up testing, we have also initiated outreach testing camps using antigen RDTs to increase access and reduce the volume of samples referred to the central laboratories. In Kampala metropolitan area, 25 sites have been set up and a similar approach is encouraged in the different districts across the country. So far, only two RDT brands have been approved for use in the country. And these include the COVID-19 Abbott Pan Bio and the Standard Q. So we request all health providers to strictly use these particular brands which are readily available on the market. They have been validated by our laboratories and allowed for use. So we'll go back to the issue of oxygen, oxygen needs for the country. The Ministry of Health is aware of the need to scale up access to medical oxygen across the country. Great strides have been made with the establishment of oxygen plants at all the national and regional referral hospitals across the country, whose capacity was adequate for the non-COVID-19 oxygen requirements. The average daily oxygen consumption for the high dependency units and the intensive care unit patients is dictated by delivery pressure and volume. Each COVID-19 patient consumes four to six cylinders per day, as opposed to one to two cylinders per day for the non-COVID-19 patients. The very high oxygen requirements remains a main constraint to expanding bed capacity. Currently, private oxygen manufacturing plants, including Roofings Limited, Oxygas, Steel and Tube, BM Steel Mbarara, NEC, Tembo Steel, Uganda Oxygen Limited, Mayuge Steel, Pramuk Steel Limited are supporting filling of oxygen cylinders to supplement the oxygen requirements of the COVID-19 patients. Apart from Oxygas and NEC, the rest have been supplying oxygen free of charge. The Ministry of Health deeply appreciates this gesture from the private sector. The Ministry will in the immediate term secure more cylinders 
to quickly bridge the gap. Install more six oxygen plants in various regional referral facilities and one of a bigger capacity in Mulago Hospital. Consideration is underway for liquid oxygen to address the large volume of oxygen required. Use of oxygen at home. The Ministry of Health has noted with great concern that a number of people continue to administer oxygen to COVID-19 patients within the confines of their homes and many other ungazetted places, a practice that could be harmful to the patient. In a number of countries, such use has resulted in medical complications to the patient, explosions and fires leading to loss of lives. This haphazard oxygen administration has resulted in harm to patients by the time they are linked to care at health facilities. The damage is beyond repair and such patients have proven difficult for the health workers to save them from what could have been easily prevented. The public should note that use of oxygen at home is very dangerous to the lives of their patients and the entire household where such administration is taking place because of the following reasons. One, a COVID patient who requires oxygen has severe or critical illness. Such cases should be managed in hospitals, not at home, where oxygen requirements can be regulated by the health workers who will also be able to handle the patient holistically without missing other disease conditions. Two, unregulated oxygen may be administered in unnecessary high doses or levels, which is toxic to severe vital body organs, such as the brain. Three, due to lack of proper monitoring, a number of patients are deteriorating because of receiving either lower or higher oxygen doses at different severity levels, as different severity levels may demand. Four, families may not know whether the oxygen being used is medical grade oxygen or industrial grade oxygen. Industrial grade oxygen is not optimally useful to the patients and a number of known severe side effects are associated with it. Five, not every COVID-19 positive patient requires oxygen therapy. And six, oxygen is highly flammable. Its improper use and management can cause dangerous fires to the household and the entire community. Oxygen is one of the class A medical supply items that should only be used after proper prescription by qualified medical personnel and its use should at all times be monitored and regulated by a trained health worker. We'll now move to COVID-19 vaccination and commencement of the second dose. Uganda received an additional 175,200 doses of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine from the COVAX facility on the 16th of June, 2021. These doses were received under a dose sharing arrangement from the Republic of France. This additional boost is to ensure that all health workers and those eligible for their second dose of the vaccine get vaccinated. Vaccination commenced on Monday, 28th June 2021 at selected vaccination points in the country. To date, a total of 861,645 people have received the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, while 129,259 people have received their second dose of the vaccine. This means we have vaccinated over 
one million people. Update on the expected procurement and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Uganda will access the COVID, more COVID-19 vaccines as follows. A total of 285,600 vaccines is expected this month under the dose sharing arrangement through the COVAX facility. This will further boost our vaccination program. The fourth consignment of AstraZeneca vaccine from the COVAX facility of 688,800 doses is expected to be delivered in August 2021. A donation of 300,000 doses of the Sinovac vaccine from the People's Republic of China is expected this month, July. The Ministry of Health has concluded the initial legal requirements to procure 2 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine through the AFRIEC Zimbank and the African Union. And the process is ongoing to conclude. Legal requirements to procure 9 million doses of vaccines through the COVAX facility under the cost sharing framework have been concluded and funds have been remitted for this. So we await a feedback on when we can receive the 9 million doses from the COVAX facility. The Ministry of Health is also at different stages of engagement to acquire vaccines from Cuba, Russia, China, and the United Kingdom besides the COVAX facility. I'll now talk about breakthrough infections following vaccination. The Ministry of Health, as part of monitoring of the vaccine efficacy, is collecting information on infections that may occur in vaccinated people. A team of experts analyzed data of hospitalized COVID-19 cases in Mulago and in Tebe hospitals from the 15th to the 21st of June 2021 to understand the effect of the COVID-19 vaccination on the outcomes of patients with COVID-19. The team investigated data from 200 patients in the current wave, and it showed that 11 patients out of the 200 had received at least one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the majority, that is 189, had not received any vaccination by the time of admission. Preliminary investigations showed that no hospitalized persons were fully vaccinated at the time of illness. Therefore, there is no current evidence to support the allegations that fully vaccinated persons have acquired severe infection and died in Uganda. This study is still continuing. Management of COVID-19 patients in private health facilities. With the increasing numbers of severe and critically ill patients, there is a strain on bed availability in all the public treatment facilities. The public treatment facilities are full and therefore patients end up in private facilities. The Ministry of Health has engaged the owners of the private health facilities and reviewed the cost drivers of treatment in order to reduce the costs. The following resolutions we arrived at. One, the private health facilities should adhere to the COVID-19 treatment guidelines provided by the Ministry of Health. Two, regular quality assurance audits will be carried out by the Uganda Medical Dental Practitioners Council and Ministry of Health in conjunction with the private sector. And three, government will explore the possibilities of supporting supply of oxygen to the private sector. In conclusion, I would like to appeal 
to all those who test positive for COVID-19 to stop interacting with people within their households and beyond even if they are asymptomatic. We request that they go into self-isolation and follow advice from health workers and start on treatment immediately if it is prescribed by a medical practitioner. However, if you have symptoms, ensure that you get linked to care in a timely manner. Remember, COVID-19 is preventable. Let us observe the standard operating procedures Respect the 42-day lockdown and stay safe. Be vigilant, protect yourself and your loved ones. For God and my country. Thank you very much, uh, the Honorable Minister, Dr. Uh, General Sacheng, uh, for that very elaborate uh, statement that you've given to us. Now, there will be a few questions coming in uh, from uh, members of the press who are with me here. And I request that um, when I call upon them to come and ask um, uh, questions of making observations, we'll have to share this microphone here. But just before uh, members of the press come in, um, a, a few things here to uh, talk to us about. Uh, Dr. Tegen, you help us understand. We are looking at a quotient um, of 1.3 billion people, and just about 1% of those have been vaccinated. Now, as we also grapple with uh, the Delta variant. We are being told that um, vaccination is one of the ways to go. Uh, and so uh, looking at um, a country like Uganda, for example, when we have just about a, a million people who have uh, been vaccinated and not fully vaccinated, we want to know what the fate here could be and to also help us understand what you in public health call the vaccine hesitancy. Because I, I think that's also the other issue. The vaccine hesitancy comes because of the different types. And, and so many people asking why the COVAX facility is only possibly giving us AstraZeneca and not what is happening um, elsewhere. We need to know that. Uh, then too, um, I, I think Dr. Cheng and the scientists here will also help us um, understand what you, the scientists now call the happy hypoxia. We want to know how it also weighs on um, the symptoms of COVID-19 and um, how fatal it, it also is. Uh, the happy hypoxia, a bit of it. Another question here is, is coming in from um, Ivan Kahua, and uh, it is um, to all of you. He says he wants to know who, uh, the minister to clarify on uh, the quarantine centers because we used to have those. And the other question here is on um, contact tracing. But to maybe just throw a light on this, um, the last time we had this infection here, uh, or during the first uh, phase, we were told that about... Um, eight to ten interactions uh, it could be affected by one positive case. That number has grown to about 23 and 30 in the second wave for every uh, positive case. We also uh, need to know whether contact tracing is still possible in this uh, particular era as we grapple with this. And, and, and maybe another question from the public here is uh, about the, the exorbitant costs of treatment by the private facilities. Yes, Honorable Minister, you've talked about these three resolutions, but I also request that because the Executive Director of uh, the Uganda Healthcare Federation, uh, Grace Sarichuanka, is here, I think she also help us understand why uh, private facilities um, are charging exorbitantly. Uh, I will now request um, members of the press who are here, and you have a question or two, uh, to um, uh, the minister and the scientists um, here, uh, before I let them respond, and um, before we, we close this down. Anybody with a question? Yes, come tell us your name, your media house that you're representing, and I think it just would be good to make the question uh, short, and if possible, one question would be uh, good for all of us. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Edward. My name is Edward Muhumza. I work for NTV. Uh, please allow me have two questions because I had. Okay, thank you, uh, Honourable Minister. My first question is: You've mentioned the list, uh, the plans of uh, acquiring more vaccines, but perhaps we need clarification on the information going on, especially about these vaccines across the globe. You've mentioned one of them is from Sinovac, China, and you have these, you know, tabloids writing that there are certain vaccines, including AstraZeneca, where people who, are, who have taken those jabs won't be recognized as vaccinated. For example, in the U.S. So 
what is the future of someone in Uganda who is preparing to take that vaccine? Secondly, I'll speak as someone who has contracted COVID-19 and went to uh, medical facilities. You talked about someone getting, uh, get, getting COVID-19 and not panicking, uh, acquiring, uh, seeking uh, medical help as soon as possible, but is that medical help there? I've been to hospitals and I felt as though I'm being ostracized by a doctor who is supposed to give me hope of healing. And I think this is going on in many facilities. So what is the capacity in these hospitals to mentally prepare these people who have contracted COVID-19 to know that they can actually heal instead of being ostracized to think, because I was treated at some point as a leper. I, I hope I'm clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamza from NTV. Uh, we, we really thank you very much. Another question here has come in from uh, the public, and um, they, they quote you, Honorable Dr. Jen Luther Ching. Regulations of private facilities managing COVID-19 patients will be done by Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Council and the Minister of Health. Reads Dr. Jenruth Acheng. And the question is, why um, is the Nurses and Midwives Council uh, not left out of this um, regulation? Uh, either way, this question could come possibly from somebody who is uh, practicing as a nurse or a, a, a midwife. Thank you, Muhumza. Any other question? Any other person with a question out there? Yes, Walter. Karibu. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, we would like to hear uh, your take as Ministry of Health on the natural remedies that are being developed here. We have uh, COVIDx that was uh, uh, notified by NDA, but also we know that uh, our own people at uh, Mulago were developing uh, plasma to be used. Uh, those studies were still underway, also, and, and uh, the one the president launched uh, the other day. would like to have an update of what's happening there. We've also seen a document uh, signed by you, Dr. Cheng, on the prohibition of entry of anyone coming from India until the 30th of July. W we would like to know the reasons why. Also, Uganda has been red listed, you know, by some countries out there. Uh, and w we want to know why Uganda is being red listed. Because what we see from statistics here is that the numbers are going down and the test positivity rate has come down from about 2021 20, to now 14 as of yesterday at least but why are we still red listed and uh, okay i'll ask there okay. thank, well. <coughs> thank you very much walter mwesigwa walter mwesige uh, from um ntv any other person with a question out there? I don't know whether um, Aine Vyona here has some questions from um, um, social media or coming in through. Uh, but the other issue, uh, Dr. Cheng, that um, I also would love you to uh, respond to is uh, the psychosocial therapy to the frontline workers. Because uh, when you look at what is happening in our um, different CTUs across um, the, the, the country, you notice that uh, the number or the ratio of uh, patients to uh, a nurse or an attendant is also overwhelming. And these people seem to be working for uh, uh, several hours. We, we also need to know um, where, how you will manage this as uh, a psychosocial therapy of uh, frontline workers who also seem to be grappling with uh, uh, this. Emma, uh, come and read a few of those questions that you have, and I uh, will let uh, the minister and the others respond. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some few questions that have come through our official social media channels. Uh, one is asking, why are fully vaccinated people falling sick due to COVID and, and some even dying? Do we need to check before uh, getting vaccinated, uh, to test before getting vaccinated? Another question is, if I have recovered 
from COVID-19 two weeks ago. Can I get my second shot of the vaccine? Will the second dose be effective when it takes more than 13 weeks without receiving it? Does the vaccine react to any other medications? If yes, which medicines? Now that children below 18 years are also getting infected and actually dying during this wave, will children get vaccinated? Is it true that the vaccine has magnetic elements as recited by clips doing around, uh, making rounds on social media. There's one from Nicholas Mwanje says, thank you, Minist Ministry of Health. Please provide an update on the government plan and the commitment to procure PPEs for health work protection and also relieve the private sector. What, uh, what quantities are in the pipeline? Uh, thank you. Those are the questions coming from online. Well, thank you very much, Emma, uh, from the Ministry of Health. Dr. Jen Ruther Cheng, I will now request that um, um, I, I think Dr. Wayengera is here. He would help me apportion these questions. But uh, before Dr. Wayengera comes on, um, I, I have, I think, another uh, last round of uh, questions. As, as Dr. Misak prepares to uh, apportion the questions to uh, those who will respond to them, you're welcome. Zahara Namali is my name. Three two questions one we are seeing so many health workers dying due to COVID-19 some are aged and there are requests from the public is there something the ministry can do to maybe regulate or advise on which health workers can go in so some of them to remain home because we are ending up losing secondly on the public health control of COVID-19 rules, a document that has just been released to the public. Uh, there are several penalties that have been involved, uh, included uh, when you're found driving without a permit, without your facial mask on, uh, escaping from quarantine centers. What drove the two months penalty and when does this start? Then um, I was also looking at the issue of barring People are spending quite huge sums of money to send off their loved ones. When the body is put in that black, I don't know the, the name you've given to it, that black cover, body bag. body bag, what more can a fa does a family have to do that it can't do, that they have to hire people who, uh, who are wearing the PPE, disinfecting every... To visiting a hospital. Uh, there was a third question on the issue of quarantine centers, contact tracing. Why aren't we doing that now? Uh, I think previously we labored to explain that the pandemic has phases and uh, we came through the point when we had imported cases. And uh, at that time, we were running after people that were coming into the... And the strategies changed in the sense that at one point, the concept of contact tracing and isolating people by quarantine becomes essentially very difficult to do because you have so many people infected. It is very uh, resource intensive and would be essentially impossible to have everybody quarantined. Uh, the Honorable Minister will answer the question of why overcharge, and I think she has probably talked about that briefly, why the private sector is uh, uh, overcharging and the mechanisms that are in place to ensure that uh, uh, some of that is resolved. Edward Muhumuza uh, asked about the plans for acquire, sharing plans for acquiring vaccines. I will leave the WR to talk about the issue of uh, why the EU and the US legislators are not recognizing some of the vaccines. Uh, uh, what capacity to educate Ugandans? We have a robust community engagement framework that uh, of course is just uh, briefly in the offing and many things 
uh, being worked out as part of the activities that we are supposed to do during this lockdown, including, of course, activating the local governments, the district task forces, the village health teams, and uh, making sure that information reaches the people. Uh, there was a question about the regulation, and I think this was an oversight on our part. This regulation actually is not only about you, Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Association. Other uh, associations will also be involved, including the Nurses Association and the Association for the Pharmacists. Walter Mwesigwa asked about the natural remedies. Uh, we previously issued a press statement on uh, the clinical trial that was done for convalescent plasma, uh, and we didn't find that convalescent plasma is beneficial, and this was consistent to the studies that have been done elsewhere, and uh, so we have not adapted that as a routine uh, approach. About the natural remedies, uh, COVIDX, the COVIDX uh, is still undergoing clinical testing. Uh, what the NDA did was to give emergency use licensia. But uh, what I'll briefly tell you is that Barbarin, which is the biggest con content in uh, COVIDX, is a, an isoquinolone alkaloid which uh, has been previously demonstrated to have immune modulating abilities, including, of course, uh, reducing the inflammation in the lungs. There are studies from China that indicate that it could have antiviral effects. But again, uh, too early for us to say uh, we will wait for the studies to come out. Uh, why are we being red listed? WR, I think I will again bring you to this. But one thing I will say is that uh, the, f the falling numbers that we have experienced more recently is not really uh, a true thing. We think it's an artifact, largely because we introduced uh, antigen RDTs. And at the time we introduced antigen RDTs, uh, we had not fully adapted our RDS or the uh, result data system to be able to capture the antigen tests. So we probably experienced a drop in numbers because we were not capturing the antigen test results. And I think that's being worked on. Uh, so we should not take that as a... Uh, uh, a true picture of what is happening. The issue of psychotherapy for frontline workers, the, uh, we have uh, an occupational therapy strategy for the health workers, uh, largely aimed at reducing infection prevention control. And uh, among some of the things, of course, that the health workers do is support each other. And we have teams that essentially visit these health workers. Occasionally, we've had epidemiologists investigate cases of infection among health workers with the idea of trying to find out what exactly probably happened uh, so that we, we are able to mitigate it. Uh, Professor, uh, why are fully vaccinated people? getting infected. I will throw this back to you. Although in the, in the statement, the minister, the minister yes. highlights some of these things. Do we need to test before we, we, we vaccinate? Uh, somebody got uh, recovered two weeks ago. Can they get their vaccine? Uh, suppose uh, if, if somebody is ready for the vaccine and it takes more than 12 weeks to receive the vaccine, second. will the second dose still be are useful. Are there any reactions with other medications from the vaccine? Will the, uh, is it true about the magnetic effects? I, I think just briefly to tell you that 
People need to appreciate that when we develop vaccines, the vaccine beyond having a component of the bug, which is not infectious, we, we design the vaccine in such a manner that we also add in what we call uh, adjuvants. And the commonest adjuvant that is used to stimulate the immune system is aluminum oxide, which is a metal. So it is not surprising that some of these uh, effects could potentially be experienced, but uh, I think I will leave several of these things to Professor Serwada to address. The issue of penalties, I think this is largely uh, Attorney General, but Honorable Minister, you could speak about it. And uh, the burial procedures, the Honorable Minister has clarified in the statement, but again, Honorable Minister, I think you need to clarify further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Misaki. Um, WR takes on first. WR. First of all, uh, the good news is that uh, AstraZeneca, the vaccine which we are taking, uh, the Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, uh, are very efficient in uh, preventing severe diseases and death. Uh, some of the studies when uh, these vaccines were uh, listed were in a clinical uh, trial settings. And we have observed, for example, in preventing mild and asymptomatic cases, uh, AstraZeneca is not as efficient as uh, the Pfizer or Moderna the vaccines. But in terms of preventing severe diseases and death, it approaches almost 100%. So I think uh, that is one thing we wanted to t the public to know. All the vaccines are efficient for almost all the variants we have here to the level of preventing severe diseases and death. A and I think that's very important point the public has to know. So, uh, but at the same time, we have to be aware when the persons uh, immunity is at full strength. This is not after the first dose, but it is usually two weeks and above from after the second dose. So after the uh, second dose, two weeks after that, one can expect such uh, protection from the vaccines we are uh, using. And I, I think I covered the part about the Delta variant being sensitive to AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer uh, at a very high level of uh, effectiveness, so a, a very high level of uh, protection. The other question is about vaccine supply. Uh, as you know, the vaccine supply is not as ideal as we would have liked it. We, we have been promoting vaccine uh, equity and fair distribution uh, and use of vaccines. That brought the, the whole issue of that we were hoping by the end of this year, 20% of each and every nation would have been vac fully vaccinated. We are still hoping that. That was jeopardized on because of two factors. One is certain countries facing a high incidence in their country, like India, uh, having export limitation. And the other is hoarding. Countries have, even before the vaccines were started being produced, a lot of countries have pre-ordered, paid, and uh, they have under their stock or under their right a lot of vaccines. There are nations which are, which may have five million population and yet has given order for 15 million people because at the time they order, they were not aware of which vaccine will come first or which vaccine will be the most efficient one. 
And to address that, there is a, a WHO, COVAX, and, and, uh, and others are uh, asking these nations to dose share. For example, the 175,000 which we are just uh, using comes from that uh, dose sharing. And as you know, the G7 in their meeting has committed almost uh, a billion doses of vaccines to be uh, available through dose sharing. So that means uh, our hope is getting up again. If you ask me, I, I, I was very worried two weeks ago. I'm less worried that in, ta in time we will get uh, more vaccines. In addition to that, there is additional investment from COVAX and the factories to increase production capacity. And more vaccines are coming into the market as well. So those are uh, the, the, the hopes we have for Africa. Yes, th it is not fair for the world, the rest of the world to reach 20, 30, even 70% of their population covered by vaccines pr fully protected, while African countries are receiving a single digit uh, proportion of their vulnerable uh, population vaccinated. So there we should all uh, push for uh, these countries to share their doses so that that vaccine uh, inequality is addressed. You also brought the issue of uh, vaccine certificate by some of the, the, the countries. Mm. WHO does not promote vaccine certificates because they put people into uh, a disadvantage for traveling. So although we understand some governments and some uh, bodies will implement vaccine certificates. To do that, different countries have different procedures. Uh, the European Union has the procedure that they will, uh, they have issued uh, a vaccine uh, certificate based on the vaccines they have analyzed. But in that analysis, they also mentioned they recognized the uh, emergency use licensing, which was given by WHO, but left the implementation to the individual member states. And some member states have, have taken that in its literal meaning and has not included the uh, COVAX facility uh, approved uh, AstraZeneca produced in Serum Institute of India or other vaccines into this. We are working with, with the European Union, our European uh, office, and you might have seen a, a joint uh, communique by COVAX uh, partners uh, which has issued, which has uh, emphasized the need of mutual recognition of uh, vaccine certificate. So we are working on that and we hope in the next week or so uh, this will be resolved. Uh, I think those are, okay, why are countries uh, red listing uh, uh, Uganda? I think e every country has its own analysis. For example, we said uh, w uh, we, we have prior country category one and category two on our, our analysis. Co what COVID is putting is that not only every individual, not ev only every community, every nation to analyze its risks and decide on the risks. But the best way of uh, resolving this issue is transparency and making your data available. So when an, another nation knows that you are transparent and you have your data, you have a reliable system, then they would rely on that data and then make sure that uh, they accept or not. But this is a dynamic process, but also it, it also matters on developing a mutual trust and the solidarity. I think those, those are the major issues which were addressed, but if needed, I'll come on other issues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Seredda. Thank you very much, uh, listeners. Um, there were several questions uh, 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 addressed to me, and I'll, I'll bear with uh, going through them. 
Uh, the first question was, um, why are fully vaccinated people sick due to COVID? Um, that is an impression um, that I also get to hear. But the minister has, in his uh, report, um, status report, indicated uh, a small study that was carried out on 200 people who are admitted. And it did find that actually there were no cases that are fully vaccinated, hospitalized. Admittedly, it was a small study. And there were only 5% who were, had just one first dose. Now, a fully vaccinated person is really defined as an individual who has got two doses of the vaccine after 14 days of, of those two doses. Because the vaccine after the second dose takes a, some time, takes about two weeks to be fully, uh, uh, impart the full benefit of the vaccination. Fully vaccinated people, uh, breakthrough infection after fully vaccinated is very rare. And that is why actually there were no cases probably found. But they do occur, so they are there. Um, and that is fairly true of any vaccine because not all vaccines are 100% effective. And therefore, in this case, effective in preventing severe disease so there's an expectation that there are going to be some very few people, very rare few people, who will be fully vaccinated and will have it. But still, it is much better to have a fully vaccinated and try to reduce the number of people who have uh, a full-blown uh, uh, severe illnesses. And it is also still true that even if you have got your first dose, you still will have some protection. Not as much as a fully dose, but you still have, you are much better off as an individual who is actually not uh, vaccinated. This is why in this study, only 5% of those who have had their first dose, not 20, not 30, are actually uh, hospitalized. So we think that this is a fairly, very efficacious vaccine to protect you against uh, severe disease. The other question was that, uh, why is it that, uh, it, um, do we need to test, uh, do we need to check for COVID-19 uh, before, uh, before we get a vaccine? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we do not need to. Uh, and our uh, rollout program does not need to take, uh, for anyone to take a COVID test before he or she gets vaccinated. And that is true of any vaccine program elsewhere in the world. And somebody also wanted to know, if you have recovered from COVID-19 two weeks ago, I think that was the question, can I get the second dose of the vaccine? When you have had a, a COVID infection, uh, we usually recommend to wait. There are various uh, recommendation, but we tend to recommend at least after 90 days from the COVID, uh, from the COVID infection to get a second dose. Yes, you have to get a second dose, but because you still have antibodies from your first alley, uh, from your first infection, uh, the take of the vaccine immediately, if you take it immediately, may not be as strong. It may not give you as strong a reaction as when you wait uh, several days or several weeks before you take a second dose. But you still need to have a second dose in order to have, to be fully really covered. And the reason why you need a second dose is because uh, the infection you have got, we are not too sure it has stimulated the body enough to give you a good boost of uh, uh, antibodies to protect you moving forward. So that's why we error on giving you a second dose to really stimulate the immune system to give you the full protection that you need. The other question um, is that, uh, do you need, uh, if, if you, uh, second dose, can a second dose still be effective after 13 weeks? I think that was the question, 13 weeks, because we have always recommended we should give a second dose in the window between eight and 12, the later the better, because we do know, especially studies that have come from UK, that the later, meaning towards 12 weeks, uh, you get a much stronger immune response. But interestingly, 
Uh, two weeks ago, there was a study that was published, uh, not very uh, in, uh, published, that showed that actually 14 to 15 weeks, you can even get a stronger immune uh, response on your second boost. So yes, after 13, uh, 14 weeks, you still can. Studies are still undergoing even how far out you can go. People have been immunized after 20 weeks, and they have shown very good immune response. Uh, to the second boost. So please, if you have you have not within the 12 weeks, it's not it's not late for you. Uh, in fact, I just read one study which uh, immunized after 30, 30 weeks, and they got a very good a very good immune a very good immune response. We don't know when after how long you need to restart, but at the moment, we indicate that please get your second dose, irrespective of how far out you have been. Um, I think uh, those were my, oh, the question of drug interaction. There was a question of vaccine and uh, vaccine drug interaction. This is a question that I actually personally get from time to time. Uh, how, you know, what, how, what are the drug interactions between the, uh, say, AstraZeneca and, uh, and when you read out the insert of AstraZeneca, um, actually, on the section of drug interaction, um, Remember, this is a vaccine that has just been uh, licensed for use somewhere in December ja last year to January this year. So the uh, full-blown interactions between uh, the vaccine and others is not very, very well, very well understood. And therefore, um, the, this is still observation um, that is in progress in trying to find the full range of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, interaction. However, always there are patients who are immunosuppressed, for example, they are on immunosuppressive treatment, and they always are very, res uh, they have been very reluctant about this uh, COVID vaccine. But so far, we do not have any reasons why to, to not to give people who are on immunosuppression uh, to, uh, to, to vaccines, to this AstraZeneca vaccine. So uh, the full-blown extent of what are the drug interaction is not completely fully uh, well studied, but this is an ongoing uh, experience. Suffice to say that probably at this point in time, we have not seen any, any serious drug interaction between AstraZeneca vaccine to warrant a contraindication. Thank you very much. Th thank you so much, Professor Sirwad Dam. Yeah. And We'll yeah, have, um, yes. And talk about the Grace will come and talk to us, um, and, and of course, uh, th thereafter, we'll also um, receive uh, the Honourable Minister Kawoya here. But mm -hmm. there's a question which is specifically to you, Honourable Kawoya. Mm. Um, what will the Ministry of Health do to frontliners' families, whereby they are the breadwinners, and besides calling them heroes, um, they've also died on duty, and they just want to know whether there is any compensation package. Uh, to Thank their you. families and for their families. And, and this was a follow-up uh, to you from the public here, yeah, to uh, Professor Sarah Dam, uh, still on the same, and somebody saying if they must travel to Europe, um, even after so many weeks, after getting the second jab of Astra, can they go for another vaccine that is acceptable in Europe? That I that's if they must uh, be travel. So many weeks later, they had their second uh, dose, and they now want to get either J and J or Pfizer or anything. Can they do that? Uh, okay. Is it okay? Uh, Grace. Please come and respond to uh, the issues of the private uh, health uh, facilities here. Yeah? And um, we'll also receive uh, Minister Kawoya to talk to us before uh, Minister Chen closes down. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I'd like to elaborate that thank you. Uh, critical care was expensive uh, even before the pandemic, uh, not, in, not only in Uganda, but across East Africa and worldwide. That we are in as a country, especially at this second wave of COVID. Before I move on to one area which uh, the minister will respond to, this is about the penalties. Mm. I'll also touch on it briefly. Mm. But to go to the question of, uh, I do appreciate the person who has put up this question about the, the, the frontliners and what government or the ministry has. As, as compensation package, the family. As a compensation package. Mm. We are all aware that uh, under our labor laws, mm. 
we have uh, what is uh, known as compensation package. Mm -hmm. So the ministry working together with our other line ministries, mm -hmm. that is the, the Minister of Labor, Gender, and uh, Social Development, Social Development mm -hmm. our Attorney General. Uh, this is very clearly spelled out. But uh, we do appreciate that, again, it is under our ministry mm -hmm. to work together to ensure that we harmonize and ensure that uh, these who are affected mm -hmm. get their due attention and then uh, their issues are addressed. Mm -hmm. That is what I can say. We have our compensation laws, the procedures that we go through. At the same time, there is a network. Mm -hmm. All ministries are under the same sectors. They work together. They do connect together to ensure that they look at such issues. And to the listener, they can go to our Minister of Gender and Labor. They can go to our Minister of Justice. They can come to us so that we give them guidance and how to go about it. One uh, person asked, and I think is my sister, that uh, the, 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 the penalties. My take to that, listeners, most of this is really a misconception where most people think that is a punishment. These penalties are not punishments. In one way is to instill attitude change. That the moment that you know that if I don't do this, if I don't observe these SOPs, this will happen. Now, to ensure that this does not happen and I'm fined for it, I must do this. That is it. I, it's a way really to take you that if you say I'm supposed to drive on the right and if I drive on the left, should you go to a market and you find policemen and women are beating you to wear a mask? Attitude change. And this is what we are emphasizing on as the ministry, as a government. Number two, awareness. Everybody now is aware that this COVID is there. It can be managed. In the, the, the minister's update statement, she has said, however, everybody is becoming a doctor. Yes. That is awareness. So everybody is trying to see how do we. But she has gone further to say, in this self, being a self-doctor, it's again dangerous. So that is another way where we should go and explain more. What I'm seeing again on this, the, the communities are aware and very much aware. Th therefore, there is now a more move towards timely information sharing and dissemination that is going back to each and every person. So to me is that uh, these penalties are there just to say, if you don't write, drive on the right and you drive on the left, this is what will happen. So to avoid that, this is what we shall do. And all other these countries, they don't have policemen. They don't have anybody. Everyone, you get out of your home, there is a mask. Even when you are traveling on the streets in Komoro, you have to travel leaving that, keep the meter. You can't, if you overpass, you must overpass to ensure somebody is behind you. If you are following them, you must leave a, a distance. So I think we have to work so much and appreciate that there must be attitude change. Now, another issue I want to touch on briefly is the home-based care. Mm. Somebody asked about it. One of my facilities worked as an isolation center. And I would pass around for free. I, it was a nursing school. But a home-based care is better than taking a patient to the center. And the problem we have is the moment you are transferring all of these community patients, then you are transmitting further on the way to the communities. So how do you manage it within a home? That is why it is better that you have a home-based center. And then this uh, an attitude... Uh, one of my, my, my the, 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 the person who asked and said he was a, a patient, but how was, but I'm very happy that the society, because my work has been more to do with the public. Mm -hmm. So I thank you so much, and listeners, I want to thank you so much, and I want to say we continue observing the SPOs, we adhere to all the directives. Mm -hmm. They say stay home, stay home for 42 days, 
then you'll see. So that is all that I could say. But I also want to condole with those ones that have lost their dear ones, and but we can still prevent this disease from excarerating. Th thank th you so thank much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. N now, this being a press conference, um, in a TV studio, we will beg that we will um, defy a little from the protocol uh, that, that you normally follow. An interesting question here uh, has come in from uh, somebody who says, um, here, I, I think it is a he or she, has just seen Dr. Diana on screen. Um, uh, we just need to know where they are because we now need them more than we possibly thought. Dr. Trini, somebody saw you on screen. Uh, could you please just come and, and respond to the question of uh, uh, the allowances? And um, then the minister will, of course, speak to us finally, and we close this down. Uh, you're welcome, Dr. Trini. Thank you. The, the, the payment of risk allowance has been made and it is still continuing. Uh, this is a continuous process, so it's not uh, an event, it is, it is a continuous process. So we are continuing uh, to pay, even those that have not yet received the one for June, it will come, so they shouldn't worry. Government does not cheat. It can only delay, but it does not cheat. So, so that's just an assurance. Um, our, our PR asked me about uh, uh, to, to talk about that. Someone was asking him about the the, the pickups, the the donations. The, the donations yes. Uh, we received about twenty nine point six billion in donations. I remember last time when we were here, we talked about it, but I'm assuming that people have forgotten. Let me repeat. Um, about 29.6 billion was collected in donations, and of that, 23 billion went to purchase the pickups as I talk now, half of the pickups procured are in the country. They are at Toyota. But we cannot pick only those. We have to wait until the entire number of pickups are all here, registered, and released to us. The other money was supposed to do renovation, I mean, uh, construction of blood bank. Uh, in Soroti, our engineers have gone ahead to do the site inspection. They have done the designs. Remember, this man came to us in April. It first went to consolidated account because that's how the legal requirement is. It goes to consolidated account, then we went to parliament.